welcome to today's lecture. Today I'm going to be giving you a lecture on applied research practice and this is going to be your launch lecture. Now historically for this module we have seen quite low numbers that appear for the launch um, because students might not decide to do the module till later or because you're master's students sometimes it can be difficult to get in. So what I'm going to do is record this lecture for you so that if you cannot make the lecture launch you can still get the full material. So if you see me looking over here, it's because I have another computer up with the presentation so that hopefully I can run through it relatively smoothly. Smoothly. So again, welcome to today's launch lecture. My name is Dr Jenny Douglas. I um, am an academic here at Hartbury and I run the MSc Sport and Exercise Nutrition Programme. My background is exercise physiology and equine science. Um, at the moment I teach exercise physiology, fitness training and testing. My PhD uh, was from the Institute of Sport and Exercise Science at the University of Worcester and uh, I looked at physiological fitness in equestrian. So that was kind of, I kind of combined, you know, my love of sport and my niche of, of equine together. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I also have a PGC in research methods and designs. Hopefully I'll be able to help you out quite a bit. But what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about what this module actually is so that you get a flavour for it and you know what you're doing throughout the rest of the the year and then if you get stuck at any point you can come back to this video um, and then maybe book a tutorial with me or your individual assigned tutor. So let's get into the meat of this presentation. So I am your module leader, my name is Dr Jenny Douglas, you can contact me on j-e-n-n-i dot d-o-u-g-l-a-s at heartpre.ac.uk. Um, <clears throat> I am the module leader, but this is a um, tutor-led module, so apart from this launch lecture and for some tutorials you might not see me a huge amount, which is fine for this type of module, but if you have any module queries, your assignments aren't up, your tutor's not getting back to you, you don't know what you're doing, I will be your first port of call and that's totally fine. So what I'd like to know is a little bit about you. So if you're watching this and you haven't actually met me, could I ask you to please send me a email with your name, your department, your research experience at undergraduate level, your equipment experience, so what, that's my dog in the background, so what you have access to, what you have access to, what you've used before in the past, and whether you have any ideas already, or like loose ideas or topic areas. So if I can ask you to email me that, the second you watch the end of this video, that would be really appreciated. Obviously when we're in class we'll do it in more detail. So about this module, this module is 30 credits long, so it's a long and thin module. And the idea is that you need to identify an original research topic that seeks to investigate a worthy question or problem. We want you to be able to critically appraise literature and critically evaluate relevant methodologies. We want you to be able to analyse data to meet those aims and objectives. So can you actually make the story relate to your original aim? And can you communicate those research findings to relevant audiences? So can you relate that back to a lay audience and then can you relate that back to an academic audience? And can you also critically reflect on your own research practice and put its value or the results in context with the wider sort of area, wider department like area requirements? So can you put it in an academic and a practical concept? So about this module, if you click on the Moodle page, you'll find there's an introduction section, there's also a place for assessment information, learning materials, reading materials, uh, there's module schedule up there, although it's mostly just this lecture, and external examiner information. So if you have any queries along the way, please head to Moodle and make sure that you've got an appropriate login and that up will up be updated regularly. Um, I've left quite a lot of material up there already, so in terms of finding like uh, resources, there's lots of resource information up there already. But if I find things pertinent to you along the way, or if any of you have any ideas of what you might find useful on there, let me know and I can, I can make sure to upload that. Um, so we have this launch lecture, and it's a mostly supervised-led module. So once I know what projects you're doing and what departments you're in, I will then speak to heads of department and allocate you tutors that are, one, have the capacity in their workload, and two, are relevant to your area of inquiry. And it will be done through mostly tutorials with them and seminars here. So if we need to have bigger seminars, so if you find that you need a bit more help with research or individual seminars with me uh, in terms of research design or statistics, we can do that. But otherwise it will be a primarily tutorial-led or tutor-led module. You are expected to do 48 um, learning 
scheduled learning hours across one and two. So that might be your data um, analysis or uh, data collection. It might be tutorials with your tutor. It might be seminars with me. And you're also expected to do 252 independent study hours. So you are expected to do quite a lot of self learn um, practice on this module. So it's really important that you start to think about how that's going to split up your time between semesters one and two and the other work commitments or study, requ study requirements that you might have. So the learning outcomes of this module are that you will be able to identify an original research topic that seeks to investigate a worthy question of problem. Like we've already gone through this, but these are the specific ones. You will be able to critically appraise relevant literature or obtain depth of knowledge via key theories mastery of concepts associated with your area of investigation, to critically evaluate relevant methodologies and justify data analysis appropriate to your research question, or to judge identified hypotheses for selected project, to systematically implement an approved um, project protocol with integrity, attention to le ethical, legal and research government frameworks. So it's really important that we make sure that we've got ethical processes, health and safety pinned down before we start trying to data collect. Uh, we want to be able to scrutinise and critically analyse data with an insight and understanding. So rather than just getting the data and regurgitating that information on paper, can we actually start to have a little bit of a think about what that actually means and take our time with it? We want to be able to co communicate clearly and concisely your findings of an independent project. And we want to be able to reflect on your own research practice. So how did you actually do? Like, what were you like under pressure? What did you do when your equipment failed? What did you do, you know, when your supervisor wasn't ready for you for a tutorial and you... I don't know, whatever. What, what, how do you react to that? What is your process? How are you as a researcher? Because a researcher is somebody that acquires a, a set of skills. It's not just the project, it's the person. You know, you can have somebody that is amazing at research design, but isn't any good at research. So really, it's we're trying to make you a critically evaluative individual that also has a flair for creativity and can go and speak to a range of audiences and present their information. So there are two components related to this module. We have component B, which is a research report. So that is your 4,000 word uh, dissertation, if you like, assignment. And then we have component A, which is a post presentation and defense. So we wanna make sure that our topic is original. That said, we're not trying to do anything crazy here. So it doesn't have to be a four part study or anything like that. We just need to be, be able to identify that there are gaps in research. So we need to start thinking about something that we're interested in and then go and do our background research and actually think to ourselves, okay, well, this has been done. This has been done. This theory suggests this, this could indicate this, and this is where the gap is. So this is what I'm going to study. So it doesn't have to be completely original in the sense that nobody's ever thought of it before and you're sitting there trying to come up with some new you know, theory that you, you've never heard of before. It could be, for example, like I've done a, my, one of my research trials was on the physiological de demands of event, eventing at a novice level. It could be that you do the physiological demands at advanced level. It's still original. It hasn't been done before. See what I'm saying? So you can use previous methodology and then apply that to a expansion of, of what has been done previously so we don't have to come up with like massive new new ideas but we do have to do something original we do want to critically appraise literature so we want to be able to look at literature and say okay this paper says this and this paper says this and these three have found this so based on all of that i think this rather than just taking each each uh, paper at study value so for example we can look at the method and think actually that only used X amount of people or that was done but the intervention here wasn't controlled or you know this was done but actually they're looking at development of physiological processes but they've only done it under three weeks is that scientific enough to see a result or something or other like that so we are actually starting to get you to think about okay well how relevant are these papers we also want you to evaluate the methodologies <clears throat> and that kind of goes hand in hand with what I just said there we want you to look at the method and scrutinize it so, for example, in my field, if I was looking at VO2 max, but I had a protocol that started at a very high speed on the treadmill or wattage on a bike, and um, I chose really big jumps in the power, I might actually completely miss VO2 max. So my, my actual design of the intervention might have caused me to not get the appropriate results. And so you can start to look at the methods in your relevant field and see if they're relevant and see if there's maybe some methodological flaws. 
it's really important that your project is approved. Um, you shouldn't be collecting any data without supervisor sign off at a bare minimum. And more than that, hopefully, if you're using any human tissue or any animals, it should go through full ethics. Now, I leave that up to you and your supervisor to have a chat about. Um, but it's really important that we make sure that we are honouring the ethics of both the study participants, but also the research institution themselves. And we want you to scrutinise and critically collect your data in a way where you are not biased. So you might not get the results that you want, that you think you should get. And that can be frustrating. It's happened to me before. We have to be really honest and we have to not tell stories with what we want. So if you think that, you know, uh, I don't know, landing biomechanics of a, of a dog jumping out of a car will be greater from a four by four than it will be a saloon and you find that it's not like the data says that it's not even if you think it is you can't tell that story because that's not what your data says you have to go with what your data says that is something that we will really pick apart if we find out that, that you are sort of bending the truth of the data when it comes to objectivity, we have to be objective with the data. We can't tell stories with it. And whilst we might not mean to, that is part of being a researcher. We have to say, OK, well, actually, we didn't find this. What would be the reasons for that? Communicating concisely and clearly. So we're going to assess that through your written report. And we're also going to assess that through your ability to present your poster. Now, presenting posters is actually quite a hard skill to do. Um, sometimes you don't have to present them. Sometimes you just stand there with them and you hope that people come in, in or hope or hope not, not to you, that people will come in and, and have a dialogue with you about your poster. But quite often you will have two to four minutes to present and you have to have that like keynote pitch ready. And so it's really important to be able to defend your poster and to, to highlight the important points that are within. And you need to be able to reflect on your own research practice. How did you cope under pressure? How did you do? Were you honest? Were you rigorous? Could you have done more? Did you find it difficult to get participants? How did you get them? Were you creative? You know? So I want you to um, read the briefs carefully that are on the Moodle page. Now, we're in week one. Your lecture is actually tomorrow. So if you're watching this post the launch, you will have noticed that your lecture briefs, your assessment briefs are not live. And I'm going to work on that today. So hopefully they'll be live by the end of the week. I'm not 100% sure why. It is a long and thin module, so they've obviously just been, been put up late. So I'll make sure that that's changed. But when you can, make sure you look at the assessment briefs. We will have component A, which is your poster presentation and defence, which will be 15 minutes. So you will have to make a poster. You can get those printed in the library. And we can talk about that in plenty more detail nearer the time. And that's worth 30% of this mark. 70% of your overall mark in this module will be through your research report, which is 4,000 words in length. So in your research report, first of all, it, you have to have uh, your proposal signed off by your supervisor pr prior to commencing any data collection. Um, usually, a research report is written in this format. Abstract, introduction, methods, results, conclusion. Usually. In some unusual circumstances, the structure of your report may differ. Let's say you're doing something a bit more qualitative or social sciences based, or if you're doing a systematic literature review or something like that, then your pr presentation may differ some somewhat. Um, but generally, that's the format. And if you're not sure, speak to me or your individual allocated tutor. And you do also need to include a critical reflection of your research practice within there. So you will be assessed on your critical reflection so I would put like an appendix of how you feel you have um, gone about your inquiry. In your poster presentation and defence you will have to produce a scientific poster or industry poster. The best way to do this is walk around the campus, have a look at posters that have been put out, have a look on the internet, ask your own supervisors and find out a little bit about posters. I will also do a video just on posters for you as well nearer the time. So you've got about five minutes to present your actual poster and then 10 minutes for questions. We would like to have your poster in A1 size and you will come into the examination and we'll hang it up and then you can present your poster for five minutes as you would if it was a conference presentation. And then we'll ask you questions around either what's on your poster or about your project in general. So for this, you're being assessed predominantly for your intellectual skills. So your ability to transfer information, the evaluation and application of the information. 
but you will also be assessed for knowledge and understanding, so your knowledge base, your methodology, and you will also be assessed for the ability to reference and cite on your poster and how you actually deliver on the day. So what do you need to do? You, there are templates for proposal and ethical forms all available on the Moodle page for you. So what you need to do firstly is think of an original self-guided idea or self-contained pilot study perhaps. So you need to think of something um, or an area and I can help you with that in the first instance. So I think personally one of the most difficult things is coming up with your original research idea. I think people come in with these massive ideas and then they're not really sure how to like refine them. So when we're creating a research idea, we need to have this box. And this is our research idea and these are all the other things that we could do, but we're gonna save those for a later date because this is where we're at in the story. So I find the best thing to do is think of something that you're interested in, okay? Something that actually you find interesting because you're gonna to have to study it for the next year. And then start to have a look around whether you have any questions about it in general. So for me, my PhD idea was born from the fact that I couldn't quite understand why show jumpers had such high heart rates when they weren't, I don't want to say they're not fit because that sounds really controversial, but aerobically conditioned. If you were exposing your heart to that high heart rate stress, repeatedly for long term, you would expect a, a, a rider to be better conditioned. And we know from research that their own capacity is moderate, if at best. So that really confused me. So I, that's kind of where I went off to study it. And I wanted to look at strength training protocols and resist and aerobic capacity protocols to improve performance in horse riders. And that's kind of where my idea and then my business has developed into. Um, and so for me, it was it was a genuine interest. I wanted I had a question that I wanted answered and no one else was answering it. So off I went to go and do it. Now that actual study changed over time. Now hopefully yours won't change too much because it is a singular study. Obviously when you study a PhD it's usually a story so you have three or four trials within one bracketed area. Well for this we're hoping that you have one smaller smaller study that you're trying to answer the question to. But my first thing would be go just go find some research like don't get so worried about putting pen to paper and just go spend some time in a coffee shop researching some papers downloading papers and having a think about you know where does this fit you do a bit of a mind map and think okay this has been done this hasn't been done this is contentious this is agreed like what do we actually think about this area of study like what do we actually know and then when you have an idea send it to me so I've put on here that I want you to send it to me by the 18th of October I mean the quicker you do it the quicker I can get back to you essentially so you can email that to me on a proposal form and I can have a, a good look over it give you some feedback and then based on what you've put on the form, um, I will allocate you a project supervisor. Now, before you have an allocated project supervisor, it will be me that you will have the direct contact with. So once you have been allocated a project supervisor, that's when you will refine your project proposal. And then you will start working in isolation with your supervisor. Of course, I'll still be here to guide you and support you through the module, but they are then your sort of lead on, on the module. It's really important that you don't actually go off and collect data until you've got ethics or supervisor sign off. And then essentially you go collect your data and you write your report, you hand in your report, and then you do your presentation of your poster in assessment period two. So your proposal is not gonna be formally marked. It's just a formative process, but it does need to be approved and signed off by your supervisor. So your supervisor has to say, this project is good to go and we're running with it. You have to make sure it's methodologically and ethically sound. Personally, if you put all the effort into your proposal, your actual report will be easy sailing. Your proposal should include the background research, the rationale, aims and objectives, methodology, and any other ethical considerations that you have. And like I said, if you feel that you need more information on development of that, give me a shout and we can have a chat about it individually. You also need to complete a risk assessment and site permission form if you are going to be collecting data off site. And anything high risk, so any anything which would be a risk to you or your participants, will need to be signed off and have scrutiny from the ethics committee. And that does have a three weeks turnaround. So if you're looking to do anything particularly dangerous or anything where the participants could be at physiological or psychological harm, it's important that you uh, get that in as soon as possible so that you can start data collecting. So, I mean, this is quite a good module where you can start to think about a pilot study for a bigger study. It's quite useful because you can start to, like, um, 
iron out any specifics that might need ironing out before a bigger project. So for example, let's say you were going to look at repeatability of spinal kinematics in dogs over ground versus grass, something that I just made up. Um, if you were going to do that, then one big thing might be the reliability of market placement. So your pilot trial might be um, repeatability and reliability of market placement in researchers on the spinal column of dogs. <laughs> Don't know. Do you know what I mean? But you could use your pilot study to be quite methodological or have a little answer a mini question that might come before a bigger project. Um, obviously, I, I'm talking to a video camera right now, so I can't invite discussion from you. But if you're watching this at this point, it's probably worth just noting down any pilot ideas that you might have. Pilot ideas are quite good for questionnaires. You can design a questionnaire and test the validity of it, uh, test the ease of flow. It could be quite good to um, test, you know, um, your bigger trial, but with a smaller population, things like that. So if you're watching this, then give yourself 15 minutes to think of a postgraduate dissertation idea. Think about ideas for potential research projects that you could do for this module. And then I want you to just, if you're obviously not in a group right now, if you're, I just want you to sit down and put your pen to paper, do a bit of a mind map and have a think about what you're actually interested in. So pause me, have a think and then come back on to me. Okay, so that's a bit of a generic module introduction. At this point, I want to talk to you a little bit about scientific posters. I don't know how many of you have done them, uh, but scientific posters are actually quite good fun. You need to pay attention to detail of the um, the layout because when you start to put it on A1, it can become quite obvious if you've got any asymmetries in you know the formatting. So what you can do is if you choose to do a um, scientific poster on PowerPoint, that's where a lot of us will do our posters, you can actually put the grid lines up and then you can check that it's all like even. But to set up your PowerPoint slide to the correct size for A1, you want to so you, you can set it up before you start. So make sure before you start doing your poster, you set up the page for A1 so that you know when you print it, it's not going to be distorted. And consider the way that the flow. So you, there needs to be a flow. And I will do a another post on this at some later date because obviously this is just the intro. But when you are talking about your scientific poster, you want it to be obvious for the eye. So if you've got random bits of information floating about in your poster, it's not going to be very helpful to you. You either want it to flow, like from, and I'm going to be backwards in your screen really, but you either want it to go down, up, down, or you want it to go top, bottom, or you want there to be arrows, like clearly outlining where the reader's eye should go, or there needs to be a big picture or, or a big bit of data or something where the eye is drawn, you know, drawn to. So I should be able to look at your poster and have a, have a good understanding of what it's about. The title should be nice and big, citations somewhat smaller, a picture or a figure where I can gather what, what your project's about. So consider alternative ways of presenting, so flow charts, figures, direction of information, numbering, all sorts of things. Be creative. Um, like, it's, like I've already said, turning the grid on can help you line up content, but it can make PowerPoint very slow. So I would say, give yourself, I would design your poster off PowerPoint and then spend the time making the detail later on and check that the resolution of figures is high and import as JPEG if you can which is better because otherwise when you print it it can look really grainy and quite poor quality and obviously if you've got a really important graph that you're trying to portray or something like that that's not going to be very useful to you and you want to use um, images to illustrate aspects of the methodology so for example if you've used like Colysis cameras or ProReflex 3D motion captures you can put a picture of that in there to highlight what your methodology was or if you've done you know sp like I was saying about spinal kinematics you can put a picture of the marker placement or in my case I was looking at VO2 and EMG of horse riders so I might have a picture of a rider with all that kit on so you look at it and you get a gathering um, you can use transparency if the colours are getting too dark. Uh, my best bet is, I mean, I've always used the template of wherever I have been. So if I was at Worcester Uni, I used the Worcester template. If I was at Hartbury, I used the Hartbury template. But I would definitely have a look at, you know, the the psychology of colours. Psychology of colours can, you know, red can be confident, blue can be mean different things, green. So have a think about a colour that you want to portray in your data. And then you want to synthesize your results down to key findings. Like this is the hardest bit, trying to really write the salient points. So you want to extract the key salient points. And I would have that on a piece of paper before you even start to write your poster. But my main tips would be just look at loads of other posters. 
just just look at loads of other posters and see which ones you think are good and see which ones you don't think are good. Generally, not so good ones are just black and white with no colour whatsoever. Lots of space. You don't want you want some space because white draws the eye in, but you don't want so much space that you're wasting your energy. You don't want the text to be too small. You want the text to be a good size. You want to have a think about like how does it look on the, the page because that's going to... I mean, obviously it's going to look bigger, but you want me to be able to read it from a distance. So have a good Google of... I can't remember the font size off the top of my head, but have a good read of the font size. You don't want the text to be too heavy. You don't want it to be so much text that I don't even want to read your, your presentation. If there's no logical pro progression, someone's going to get bored really quickly of your poster. So you want it to be very obvious the direction of where you want me to put things. Dark backgrounds and texts are generally, un well not so much text, but dark backgrounds on top of dark text are generally avoided. And try not to make figures too small or of poor resolution. And don't get too excited about the colour scheme, because sometimes it can just be a little bit too much. Simple is often better. So when we think about scientific um, hints and tips, you can go on to slide size, you can make it portrait, um, you can do the height and width, so you can look at the height and width of A1 and then you can set up your poster in that, in that size. Um, and you can also, I mean you've got some examples here of ones that um, the previous module leader did, Alison, um, and she, as you can see, it, she's used like box text, so you can see on the left that's what it looked like before she put the poster up, and on the right that's what it looked like with the grid lines. So as you can see the grid lines really help you to make sure that, that the Harpy signs are equally distributed and that the posters are equally distributed, the pictures and that the text is, you know, you can play with um, a, with symmetry or asymmetry purposefully so that you can have things that are more heavy to look at on one side you would have more text based on the other. When you are presenting your poster, generally speaking you want to stand next to it but make sure you're not standing in front of it. It can be useful to point to appropriate pe pieces of information so our eye is drawn to that area. Usually speaking you would have your institution logo on there somewhere. You definitely want to have citations usually bottom out of the way. Um, graphs and text are big but when you present a poster at a scientific congress you have them done in different ways. Some, some will put a lot of focus on the posters particularly if there's lots of them. So you might have a, 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 like a chair who will come round and interview you. I've had that before, it's quite nerve-wracking, but at least people listen to your work. Other places you've got to attract their attention. So you go up and you say, you sort of look smiley and I hope that they're going to ask you. You could directly ask them a question, depends what type of person you are. But generally speaking, you're just trying to get a key point, a key take-home message. So basically, what should I do with this information? What, what can I take away from this study as an actual human being or an animal? What, what, can, what, what can I do? What does this research, like how does it make my life better, my animal's life better? So really think about that because sometimes we can get lost in the academics and forget the practicality of research. Um, so that's your scientific hints and tips for now. What about your research report? Well, your research report, you must include an introduction and an introduction can repeat information that is further on in the project. So you don't want to not introduce areas for fear of having to regurgitate it later again. It's supposed to introduce the entire topic area. Personally, I would write that section last and it should provide a persuasive rationale. So why are we studying this? Like why? What is the gap in research? What has been done? What hasn't been done? It needs to have critical evaluation of the literature. It needs to say this has been done, this hasn't been done, this hasn't been done well. You know, this hasn't been investigated to full depth and therefore we need to know this. Why do we need to know it? Methods have to be clear, they have to be detailed and they must be repeatable. I should be able to read your project and go and do it myself. Results should include full statistical output, outputs where stats have been used and use pertinent figures. So not just the p-values, we need all the relevant statistical values. Um, Laird Statistics, L-A-E-R-D, is a fabulous resource. Um, it is a membership basis. There's lots of free information, but for the sake of this, I would consider getting a membership near the end. I think because it talks you through, through step by step and you don't have to carry a textbook around with you all the time. Personally, it saved me through my PhD. So I would, I would definitely use that if you can, because sometimes you don't learn things unless you do them yourselves. And I had my supervisors tell me things till I was blue in the face. And it wasn't till I went step by step through Laird and did it myself that I was like, oh, that's how you do that. It also tells you how to present the data as well. 
Um, your discussion should discuss your findings in the context of wider literature and it should discuss your findings, not the findings you want, not the findings you hoped, the findings that you have. Okay, it's really important that I make that obvious because if you tell a story that you don't have in front of us, we can't mark you well for it. So you have to include, include limitations, but that doesn't mean that your discussion starts with, well, this study didn't find this because my study was crap. You know, you want to highlight your limitations, but in a academic appropriate way. So for me, it might be that actually 200 watts as a starting point on my bike may have been too high for my population, and future research may wish to look at a lower starting point on their aerobic capacity testing. So I'm saying that there's flaws there, but I'm not saying my results are rubbish because of this. Um, you want to make sure that you critically reflect on your own research practice with the project design and relate this to wider research area, which almost in a way comes into the limitations there. You want to avoid any extreme lay communication. You want to make sure that you're not being chatty in your academic style. And the only way to get better at academic writing, in my opinion, is to read lots of academic literature. Test things, try things, ask your supervisor what they thought of this paragraph. Um, and also, I would say your report, you probably write it 10 times before you get the final thing. So if you start writing and that's your final copy, you really have to ask yourself how seriously you're taking the, re the writing process. Writing is an art form. Um, it comes from, academic writing comes from a lot of logical structure and so in my mind you should be thinking about the structure and the message that you're trying to say and then the writing should be developed. So you should be writing, editing, rewriting, editing, reworking, telling a story. So all your paragraphs should link one to another. So eat all your paragraphs, you know, one paragraph should blend into the next paragraph. Each paragraph should have like a mini intro, a main section and a, not a conclusion but, but something to like sound out the paragraph. And they should flow from one to another. So I shouldn't be reading one paragraph on X and then another one on Y and be left thinking, oh, where, how do we get to that point? So make sure that you take your writing seriously. I would have, I would give myself a significant period of time to think about the structure and what I'm trying to say. Save all copies. Don't, don't save, uh, personally, I wouldn't save over copies unless they're minor tweaks. So if you make major structural changes, I would save it as version 1, version 1.2, version 1.3, and then if you submit it, that could then become version 2, version 2.1, version 2.2. I know that sounds really crazy, but <clears throat> and this might be more down the line when you get to PhD stage, but you might have written something really fabulous in version 1.1 and then had a moment where you think, oh no, that's rubbish, deleted it, written something else, saved over it, and then when you come to talk to your supervisor and they say, actually, I think you should write a paragraph on this, you'll be like, oh no. I wrote that and I've got to I'll try and remember what I've written. So personally, I know it's a lot of saving and it's a lot of keeping on top, but I would put a track number at the bottom of your copy. It, personally, it's up to you. I would anyway. I would put a, a version number at the bottom and then I would, you know, make notes somewhere of which version I'm at and which version I'm sending so that you can keep back, back copies. I don't think you should have one version of a report in my opinion and I don't think you should start writing and, and have the intention of that being your final piece of work. I think you need to put a lot more, if you want like good writing, you need to work on the writing. You you need to give as much thought process to the writing as you do the structure of the method, I think. You don't want to have figures without any captions or axis labels or random. You want to take it seriously. You want your, your figures to tell something. They're, they're there for a reason. You don't just plonk them in and hope for the best. Um, make sure you use subheadings that are appropriate. So not so many that you got paragraph and, and, and thing, but you want signposting of the reader. So I want to know, oh good, we're coming on to a different section now. Not just like, well, hold on a minute ago, we were talking about EMG and now we're talking about, you know, something else completely different. I want to know where we're going. You don't want random charts, random bar charts, random pie charts that don't really mean anything. Um, you want figures made in Excel and SPSS that yourself Sometimes I do my stats on SPSS and then make my figures in Excel. I personally like making figures in Excel. I find them more professional, more appropriate than making them in SPSS. Um, there is a guide on uh, Moodle for making attractive figures. Um, you don't want figures automatically generated from SPSS, just copy and pasted or PDF'd in. That's, it just doesn't look nice. It's not appropriate. Um, you don't want to have biased subjective discussion. So you need to make sure your discussion is surrounded on the data that you actually collect. So you need to tell a story from the data, not tell a story from what you think. So resources. Um, 
lots and lots of resources, lots of statistical support. I've put some examples here, but for me, um, loads of SPSS books. Uh, lead statistics was a huge one for me. Um, I really love lead statistics. There's lots of tutorials online. L A E R D. I think it's brilliant. I personally would advise you to go have a look at that. We do have reference management software in the library. Something I wasn't very good at, if I'm honest, was doing reference management software. So uploading the citations as you go along and then adding them in the end. I, I, I think you just have to find your own process. I didn't work too well with that. Um, but there is things like discovering statistics using R. Andy Field is, is a guy that has done a lot of, of statistical work and he has a lot of YouTube videos as well. Discovering statistics. There's also statistics books per subject area. So I have a good one in sport. Um, you might find another one, uh, Choosing and Using Statistics by Dyson, I think is a good one. There's Biomeasurement Books, Lead Statistics is a great online resource. So they have lots of statistical resources in the library. And the thing with re the thing I personally find about statistics is, I think I'm only good at the statistics that I use for my own research and I only know how to use those because I took the time to research which ones I thought I needed to use and then I went through lead statistics and went through SPSS a number of times and then you become proficient in using those tests I don't think you can go up to a supervisor and say what test do I need to do like we don't just know that off the top of our head unless you actually go and teach statistics it, like on its own you know we are yes scientists but we will have to do the research on the statistics ourselves as well so I think it's really important that you take ownership of that statistics a little bit and not just expect your tutor to know everything and take a bit of responsibility instead of just being like oh I don't know about statistics well go read about it learn about it say I think it might be this based on this what do you think rather than what stats test do I need to do I think it's a kind of and I mean this in a loving way lazy question to just say what one, what one should I do um, I think it's really important that you read about it so that you understand why you think you're choosing the test that you do so that you have more confidence with the test that you've chosen when you do. But obviously, I'll be here to support you as will your, your tutor. So don't worry about it too much, but just make sure. I mean, once you set up your aim and you have your hypothesis, you should be able to select a, a test from there. So you should, in theory, be able to play with the test you're going to do before you even have your own data. You can like do some makeup data and, and play with the statistics and play with the graph so that when your actual data comes through, you kind of know what, what that's going to actually look like. So I've got a mini task for you. For those of you that are watching this on the video and not live, I'd like you to just turn, the, turn me off for a minute and have a think about the main challenges you feel you're going to have associated with this module. So I'd like you to discuss the main challenges you think you're going to have associated with this module and then discuss it um, or not discuss it with anyone, but like write it down and have a think about it. And if you think it's anything particularly pertinent that I need to know, do send me an email. Okay, so once you've unpaused me, I want you to have a think about your research ideas. This is going to be one of the most difficult parts for you, I think, unless you've already got a really solid idea in there. Um, coming up with the, the topic is quite hard, and it's even harder when you don't have an allocated supervisor. So at this point, if you need to have tutorials with me, that's absolutely fine. We can do them via Skype, we can do them face to face, we can do them on the phone. You know, uh, we can. It's up to you, really. So we can try to make it as accommodating for us both as possible. Um, you know, I don't want you driving in for two hours um, to come in for a half an hour tutorial. So we can we can just do it on the phone or on Zoom um, or Skype or things like that. So. Um, I find the best way to come up with a research idea is just to talk it out with someone. But you have to take responsibility for the idea because whoever you have, whether it's me or whether it's another tutor, we're not going to know the area of research unless it's my area. I won't know what research is out there. So when you say, oh, I've got an idea, do you think I could do this? I'm going to be like, I don't know because I'm going to have to sit on Google for <laughs> Scholar for three hours and look at it. And that's not fair. It's not fair for you to expect us to do that. So I would say once, you, once you're enrolled on this module, give yourself some time. Um, go get a coffee. I mean, a lot of research involves a lot of coffee or, or equivalent hot tea or whatever. And go give yourself some time. And like I said, think about what you're interested in. And then get on Google Scholar, get on Science Direct, get on Wiley, get on PubMed. Just have a look. Say, like, get a good file system going on your computer and save papers that you think are relevant. And you don't have to read the entire paper at this stage. You could just read sort of the abstract and the results or the main discussion points and then save the full paper for when you've actually determined, okay, I think this paper is actually going to be useful for me. Um, give yourself some time. Make sure that your study is visibly distinct from your postgrad dissertation or other modules. 
you do not want to copy yourself, okay? You can copy some things and you could pilot leading into a main project, but you definitely don't want it to be a direct copy because turn it on and pick that up. You do want it to be novel and you want to make sure that we do actually have the equipment and consumables that are needed. Like you don't want to do a lactate, blood lactate trial and realise it's actually going to cost you a thousand pounds in lactate with markers and that you can't do it. And you want to make sure that the question you have is actually testable in the time frame that you have. So obviously your research is going to be limited by funding and it's going to be limited by time and it's going to be limited by resources. And so we understand that. We're not expecting anything groundbreaking here. We're just expecting you to work within the means. But my main piece of advice here is go and have a think and find something you find interesting and come up with what's been done and what hasn't been done and a rationale before you even ask for help from a tutor. At that point, when you come to a meeting with me and you say, right, I want to look at grass sickness in horses and what owners' perceptions of it, or whatever, I don't know. You come to me and say, this has been done, this hasn't been done, and this is why I think it's a problem and we need to research it. Then I can say, okay, well, have you thought about this? Or have you thought about that? And I can have that discussion with you. Whereas if you just say, I'm interested in horses with grass sickness, I'm just going to say, okay, that's nice, but I don't know what's been done because I haven't researched it. So I kind of just sit there like a bit of a lemon. Whereas if you've done the work, I can help you. So in this intro lecture, we've gone through the module structure, the learning outcomes and your assessment strategy. So you should have a general understanding that, OK, well, this module, you have to do a pilot study or a small, small study. You do have to get ethics. You do have to write it in a short report form. So introduction, methodology, results, discussion, conclusion. You do need to have a 4000 word written report. You will have a five minute post presentation and 10 minute post defense. And you will need to come up with your project ideas, ideally by mid-October, so that I can allocate you a supervisor. Okay. So thank you if you've watched this entire 40 minutes. Obviously, it will be longer if you come face-to-face -face because we'll have breaks and we'll have discussion points. If there's anything that you need me to do a video on, I am happy to not treat this as an e-module, but I'm happy to try and facilitate your learning through e-lectures. And so if there's anything that you have a particular topic on that you want me to present, um, let me know and I will make sure I get that sorted for you. So you can contact me at jenny.douglas at heartfood.ac.uk and I hope that gives you a little bit of an introduction to the module. Your tutors won't be allocated until I have that project proposal in. So hop on the phone with me if you need to or send me some information so that I can help you along the way. Um, yeah, so happy researching. Get that coffee in.